section uh, about the Great Commission. Uh, some call it the Great Command. It is a great command, but it's also a great commission. And the difference in a command and a commission is that with a commission, you're going in another person's name and in another person's power. And of course, when we're doing the work of God, we're going in the name of the Lord Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so that's how we witness. And we do that at home and we do that all over the world. And I'm glad the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So I want to look tonight at God's manner for missions. God's manner for missions. And as I study the scripture, I find in the first five books of the Bible, or the first five books of the New Testament, uh, rather, uh, this great commission. And in each of them, there's something different said. It's the same commission to do the same thing, but it's said in a different way. There's a different emphasis on the commission in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Acts. And so I want to focus on the verses in each of these books real quick, give you five thoughts on the manner of God's uh, mission. And show you the emphasis, I believe, that God was given us in each of these gospels and then the book of Acts. Now, when we think about missions in the church, and of course the local church is God's primary uh, agent to get the gospel to the world. Primary agent for God to get uh, the missionary to the field in the world. It's the local church. God loved the church and gave himself for it. And he uses his church to reach the world. Now, in every congregation, there's three kinds of people concerning missions and the commission. First of all, there's the go missionary. That's the person who uh, has a burden. That's one who takes on the responsibility. That's the one who uh, uh, loves the Bible and loves the Lord and wants to put their hand to the plow and get to the work and witnesses to people and shares the gospel with people. The go missionary. You a go missionary? He was encouraging us to take out the gospel tracts and pass them out and spread the word. That's what a go missionary is all about. And we are all missionaries. I may have a specific ministry, but we're all missionaries when we get saved because God puts it on our heart to share the Word of God, commands us to share the Word of God with others. So we need to be a go missionary. Second of all, there is in the church a co-missionary. Amen. A co-missionary. That's somebody who may not have the ability to go, but they have the ability to partner with. Amen. Uh, and there's many things that can hinder us from going, but uh, the Lord gives us the ability to help other people go. That's why we have offerings for missions. That's why you support missionary. That's why you may have faith promise. That's why you uh, give to missions monthly. Uh, he, he wants us to co-labor with others to go to places that we are not called to go or cannot go to get that same gospel to the world. Amen. So we could be a go missionary. We could be a co-missionary. And the third one we don't want to have any part with. This is a no missionary. A no missionary. These are people who don't care about missions or souls. Amen. Whether it be at home or, or around the world. They may come to church. They may sit on pews. But they don't give. They don't pray. They're unconcerned. Amen. And sometimes they even get negative about being a go or a co-missionary in the church. We don't want to be a part of that. I don't ever want to be a no missionary. I want to be a go missionary. I want to be a co-missionary. I want to give my life. I want to give my money. I want to give my means. I want to give my energy. Amen. To being a goer and then also being a co-missionary. But I don't ever want to sit down and quit on God and getting the gospel out. Now I want to show you the emphasis of each of these books in the first five books of the New Testament. The first one we see is in Matthew 28, and you're familiar with all these texts. So I'm not giving you new texts, but I just want to show you an emphasis that God showed me in my heart. Notice first of all in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake. Now in all of these instances, we'll find God is the one doing the speaking. Amen. That's why uh, it's so authoritative. That's why it's so important. 
Amen. It's not the work of men. It's the work of God. Amen. Sowing the seed, being a missionary, being a witness is the work of God. And that's what he's called. That's what he's concerned about. And he's the one speaking these words. Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Boy, I like that. He uh, has all power in heaven. I don't know how many angels there are, but I know there's a bunch, amen. And they're serving Jesus in heaven. And when he speaks, those angels in heaven do not question, but they simply obey and they do it immediately. Isn't that wonderful? That's because he's got all power in heaven. Well, you know what? He's got servants on earth too. He says he's got all power in earth as well as in heaven. And he has servants down here. He has servants in You are servants of the Lord. Amen. And so when he speaks these words that we're about to read, he wants us not to question. Amen. But he wants us to go according to his command and know that we have all power that goes with us in heaven and in earth. And so uh, notice the next phrase. He said in verse 19, Go ye, therefore... Because we have his power, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, notice in this the emphasis of the commission that God has given in the book of Matthew is the power Amen. of missions. The power, all power is given unto me. Amen. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. He said, and lo, I am with you always. Not always. There's no S on the end of that word. Amen. We do know he's with us always. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But the commission he's talking about, he's saying, I'll be with you always. That means from the beginning of you starting to go in obedience, he'll be with you until the end, till you cross the finish line. And he's going to be with you every step of the way. And you got all power going with you because it's God's power. The power of missions is done by the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's God. Amen. The Holy Ghost. The power of missions. Notice in verse 18, the power of his word. And Jesus came and spake. Amen. He used to have a commercial on TV that said, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. You ever heard that one? Well, I say it a little better than this. I don't know E.F. Hutton, and I don't know if he's got the thing to say or not, we ought to listen or not, but I do know God, amen, wrote this book, and I know what God said in this book, and when he speaks, amen, in his power, we need and must listen to his command. Amen. So we have the power of his word. This is coming from God. When you go out to knock on doors, when you go out to pass out a gospel tract, when you leave it laying on a table after you eat at a restaurant, you're leaving the power of God unto salvation. And you got the power of God to help you do that. The power of his word. Jesus spake. Then notice in verse 18, the power of his will. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Whatever he wants to happen in heaven is happening. Amen. And I say it like this. Whatever he wants to happen on this earth is happening. Amen. Yeah, people talk about the society that we live in and the chaos and the mess that we're in. And it looks to us like it is in a big mess. Amen. But if you look at it from heaven, God's saying it's just exactly on time. His plan is being worked out. And God's not in heaven sitting on the throne biting his fingernails tonight worried about what's going on down here. It's all just working according to his plan. Amen. That don't mean we shouldn't pray about it, be concerned about it. Amen. What it means is we ought to look at it like Jesus as the souls are still dying and going to hell. He's called us to be witnesses, called us to tell them about him. And we just need to be faithful at the job until he comes. And he'll take care of the results. Amen. You know, when you stand at the judgment seat, the beam of seat, and you gain or lose rewards, you're going to gain or lose rewards based on your faithfulness. Amen. And so uh, when you witness to people and you sow the seed, your responsibility is done in the sense of salvation because you can't save people. I can't save people. Amen. Churches can't save people. 
Jesus is the only one that can save people, amen. But we're responsible to get the gospel out and to them, and then the Holy Ghost takes it from there, and he does his work and his business in his way, and we're not responsible for that. So we're going to give an account to God on our faithfulness to sow the seed. And he said, if you'll sow it bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. And, of course, we know just by the law of nature, if you don't sow seeds, you're not going to have anything. Amen. And this is the seed. Amen. The Word of God. And so we have the power of His will. Then notice the power of His way. What did He tell us in this great commission in Matthew? Well, He told us mainly four things. Go you therefore. He's telling us to preach. He's telling us uh, as we go to, uh, first of all, to go, and then we're to preach. And then we're to baptize those who are saved, and then we're to teach them, disciple them. So four main things in the way as we walk with God in missions and in this commission. We go. Are you going? There's no way you're going to win people to God if you don't go. You got to go. You got to sow the seed. And that's the command. That's the commission. To go. You're not going in yourself and in your power. You're going in another one's name and in another's power. And when you go, you're to preach the gospel. We'll see that in a moment. And when people receive the gospel, receive Jesus Christ, then we baptize them by immersion. And then we begin to teach them the doctrines of the scripture, how they ought to be living for Christ according to the scripture and see them grow in grace and knowledge and see their faith grow and see them become mature believers. The power of the way of God is tremendous. Then he speaks about the power of his whereabouts. Now, where is he at when all this is happening? He said, lo, I am with you all way. Amen. From beginning to end, I'll be with you. And my power is with you as you do my work and my will in obedience. Now, we can run around this world and do our own little thing, you know, and waste a lot of time in our own power. We can play church in our own power. Right. Are you listening? We can act like, you know, we're something in our own power. But we won't get a whole lot done. But if we'll realize that we're nothing and he's everything and we go understand we're going out in his name and in his power, then God will take that, amen, and, and we promote him. He'll take that and he'll save folks. Lives will be changed, and we'll see the power of God with us everywhere we go. So Matthew speaks about that power of mission. Now look over in Mark 16, verse 15. Here's Mark's view of the Great Commission. He writes it down under inspiration of the Spirit of God. Mark 16, 15, he said, Let's see, verse 15, he said, he, here it is again, Jesus speaking, he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now in Matthew, we had the power of missions. Now Mark, he emphasizes the plan of missions. God said, I'm going to give you my power to go. And what I want you to do when you go is preach the gospel to every creature. That's the plan of God. That's how God so designed it for people to get saved. Preaching. Amen. And he wants it preached to every creature. Everybody in the world. Amen. Someone said deserves to hear the gospel at least once before anybody in the world deserves to hear it twice. How's that going to happen? Well, we're going to have to go preach to every creature. That's the plan of God. Notice the command in verse 15. He said, go ye into all the world. That's the command of God in this commission. Go ye into all the world. Now, how are you going to go into all the world? You live in Greer, South Carolina. God had not uh, uh, put you uh, uh, in the world of missions. He planted you in this church, amen, to be a missionary here and reach your Jerusalem and in your community. Well, how do you reach the world? Well, you do it in many ways, but right here on the wall is God's chosen way. Help send others to those places all over the world. Because there's people everywhere. Eight billion plus now. People in the world. Amen. That need to hear the truth of the gospel. 
And God said the command is to go in all the world. So I go in my own world, my own little world, my Jerusalem, but then I'm going around the world through missions and through missionaries and through the word of God going. That's the command. Go ye into all the world. Then notice the call. He said, and preach the God. We don't just go to go. We go to preach. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. We know what the gospel is. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. The death, burial, and resurrection according to the scripture. That's what we're to take to people. When you go out and witness, amen, you may have to break the ice by talking about a ball game. You may break the ice by talking about the weather. You may talk about those children, those grandchildren. Uh, Listen, the job they're on. Amen. Take just a few minutes. Amen. Win them over with friendship and then take them straight to Calvary. But if you go there and talk about everything under the sun, get up and leave, and you never sow the seed of the gospel, you've wasted a trip. I know a lot of visitation programs, they're doing nothing but wasting a bunch of time. What we got to do when we go, amen, is remember, we want to be cordial to people, we want to be kind to people, we want to make friends of people. But in the process of making friends, we don't want to get up and leave without doing what God's told us to do and preaching the gospel to them. Amen. And preaching doesn't mean you stand like I am and scream at them in their living room. It means you just sow that seed and be a witness and then follow up on that seed. Sow another one if you have to and another one and pray over that. Amen. And God will bless it. He's called us to preach the gospel. Then the plan of God is to the creatures. He said now this, every, go preach the gospel to every creature. Don't bypass one. Don't bypass one street. Don't bypass one color. Don't bypass, amen, the poor section of town. Don't bypass the rich section of town. You go into all the world and preach the gospel. Are you listening? Now, we got Christians in our churches all across this land. They're too proud to go in the poor neighborhood and witness. We got some who are too proud to go into the into the rich neighborhood and witness to those people. You know what? Both of them are going to die, rich or poor, and both of them either going to heaven or they're going to hell based on what they did with Jesus. Amen. And so listen, uh, Jesus, he shows no respect for persons. God says you go to everybody. Sow the seed to everybody. Amen. We're not careful. We'll get our group and our mindset on, well, we're going to try to reach this category of people, this level. Oh, no, Jesus said the gospel, the commission, what he came to die for is the sins of the whole world. Reach out to those who are hurting in need, who nobody else wants to talk to. Win them to God. And then reach, amen, to those who have everything in this world amen. with the gospel. There, there somebody's going to die. We need to reach everybody. That's God's plan. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. Every creature. Look with me in Luke now, verse uh, chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 46. Luke 24, 46 to 49. We see in Matthew the power of missions is emphasized. In Mark, the plan of missions. In Luke, I see the preaching of missions emphasized. Look at verse 46. Of, Mark, uh, of Luke 24. He says, And said unto them, that's Jesus speaking, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins, what's the next three words, should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Here he emphasizes preaching, uh, missions. He said that this gospel should be preached. I don't know why God chose preaching, but he chose preaching. Amen. Now, after people are preached to, they're saved by God's grace, then they need to be taught as well as preached to and grow in grace and knowledge. But I'm here to tell you, God uses preaching to save them that will believe. Preaching. 
The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. Nothing can take the place of old time Holy Ghost filled Bible preaching. I'm glad you still got a church, amen, that still preaches the Word of God. Amen. Not a lot of hoofla around here, like you can see in some churches. Amen. We just keep it simple and we just preach the word of God and we sing the good old hymns out of the book and we just tell people about Jesus. I'm telling you, that's what God said to do and we'll be faithful at it. Amen. When someone comes, amen, or when we go to reach them, God will use us to get them the gospel. Preaching. The preaching of it. It should be preached. Now, I like singing just as good as anybody else. I like some groups just as good as anybody else. But I'm here to tell you, God didn't say by the foolishness of singing, he'd save them that believe. Now, I believe the gospel is in some songs, and God could use that, but he don't use singing groups, amen, to go across the country to see people saved. He uses preaching. God chose the foolishness of preaching. Not foolish preaching, but the foolishness of preaching. That's his business. That's not ours. So we just preach. Preach the gospel. Let me say this about preach also. I've learned this a little bit over the years. Amen. When you look at the Bible and you study preaching, there's only 4% of the time that word preach is used in the sense of standing behind a pulpit like I am tonight and doing what I'm doing, heralding forth the word of God. Only 4% of the time. 96% of the time when you open this book and it's talking about preaching, it's talking about witnessing one-on-one. -on -one. That's because the majority of our life is not amen behind the pulpit. It's out there in this old world where people are at that need Jesus. And he wanted to emphasize, amen, Jesus preached in the synagogue, did he not? But many more times did he go to a person one-on-one -on -one and share his gospel with them and win them to God. Amen. Oh, yeah, it's about one-on-one. -on -one. It's about personal relationship. It's about personal witness in the Bible. And then he wants us to come together in the church for edification of the body of Christ, for the growth of the children of God. Amen. And we do that by preaching the word of God that other 4% of the time behind a pulpit or behind a podium. Amen. In a Sunday school class sharing what God wants us to be. But that's to be done. Amen. Preaching. Now, in verse 46, we see the passion that he had about preaching. He said, thus it was written, thus it behooved Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day. Now, he's talking about his passion week here. How he was uh, beaten. How he was handled. Amen. And suffered and bled and died for the sins of the world. He said, I had a passion be crucified. The Bible said he set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. Amen. He, he did a lot of good things while he was here on the earth, but his purpose was to come and die on a cross. The crucifixion is mentioned. Then notice also the resurrection. It behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That was his passion. Calvary was his passion. His resurrection was his plan. And he had a passion. He said, I want that message preached to a lost and dying world. Then he tells us where he wants it preached. Verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. He tells us where to take that. The places he wants us to go. All nations. I don't know how many there that all nations is today. But I know there's a bunch of nations out there. And I know every one of them he wants to us to reach them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said to all nations. Then he talks about the propagator. Who's supposed to do this? Look at verse 48. And ye and ye are witnesses of these things. We're the propagators of the gospel. We're the one that's going to go. We're the one that's going to preach. Amen. We're the ones that's going to give. It's those who have received the grace of God, the gift of God, of eternal life, that will have a burden to go and give beyond our ability even many times so that God can reach other souls with his gospel. We're propagators. We are witnesses. That's what a witness is. He tells what he's seen and heard. And we tell what we've seen and what we've heard from the Scripture, from God working in our own lives. We take it to them and we share that gospel. And God, you, we're propagating. You know, if we don't go, they won't receive. They can't hear. 
Amen. Uh, I believe Romans talks about how shall they go without a preacher? How shall the preacher uh, go except to be sent? And, and so on. Amen. Uh, we got to do the commission. Do the commission. Not just believe the commission and read the commission. We got to do the commission. We got to, amen, uh, put it in shoe leather. Reach the lost at all costs for the glory of God. Then notice verse 49, we have the promise again of the Holy Ghost power. Behold, I send to you the promise of the Father upon you, but tear ye in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. We must know we're going in the power of God. That's why the Bible tells us to get ourselves full of the Bible. Amen. Full of the word of God. And then, amen, get on our knees in our closet of prayer and pray and have the mind of God and have the spirit of God, the power of God through prayer. Amen. And as we go out in that mindset, as we go out in that power, God will do great and mighty things. He's promised it in his book. And so Luke emphasizes the preaching of missions. Mark emphasizes the plan of missions. Matthew emphasizes the power of missions. Now look over in John chapter number 20, verse 19. John 20, 19. Here we have the passion of missions. He said, in this verse, we'll see it. He says, so send I you. His passion. Let's look at verse uh, 19. John 20, 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut with the, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus, stood in the midst, and said to them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto him his hands and his side. Then were his disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. Now look at this. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Amen. Now, I believe Jesus had passion when he came to the earth, don't you? And lived his life and died on Calvary. I think he did it with passion. And he's saying, I want to take that same passion that I came in with. Let nothing stop me from fulfilling the will of God. He said in John 17, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. He had a passion. I mentioned a while ago, he set his face as a flint. He wasn't letting anything turn him away from the will of God for his life. He had passion about that gospel. Amen. It was real in his soul. Amen. And he shared it with passion so people would realize it's not just a religious thing I'm going through. It's, it's my life. It's who I am. If we're where we ought to be as an individual or as a church, we'll understand that we don't have a mission program. We are a mission program. Amen. Amen. We don't have a mission program. We are a mission program. Amen. If I could just get churches to understand that, it would change their whole outlook. It would change their whole ministry. Amen. I've heard over and over, we got a mission program. We got 100 missionaries in our program. We got five missionaries in our program. Well, that's wonderful. You, you, you got five or you got 100, but if you'll turn it around and realize it's not a program. It's not just something you give money to. It's not just something you do out of a routine, but you are mission. You are missions. Your life is missions. You live and breathe missions. If you're where you ought to be with God. And there's few, there's few, there's few, handful, just a few in every church that I've seen. But, but thank God for the few, amen, who have a passion for God, a passion for his word, a passion for souls. A passion for the things of God. Amen. The Bible said in the last days there'll be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Amen. You know you're in the last days. Just look around. Look around. Me and pastor was talking about it before the service. It used to be the, the pews had less seats empty than more. Now they got more empty than less. Amen? More, less people, more empty than what it used to be. Why is that? They love pleasure more than they love the things of God. Right. Things are more important outside the building than they are inside the building when they're supposed to be in the house of God. They love the world more than they love God. It's not that they're not saved. Many of them are saved. They just love the things of this world more than they love the things of God. Now what do we do? We've got to get on our knees and start praying for them.
Just like we pray for sinners to be saved, we need to pray for saints to get right with God and get back where they belong. I hear a lot of people talking about COVID, and COVID was a terrible thing to go through. I pastored through COVID. That's the first thing. I mean, as far as I know, even in... Brother Waters and Dr. Sotler and all the my heroes of the faith never had to face anything like that. It was, it was a navigation scene. You, you know, you wanted to take care of your people, but you wanted to be in church and preach and do what God told you to do. And, and, and nobody knew exactly what was going on when it first started. We had to figure it out. It didn't take long, did it? Amen. We figured it out. Amen. That there was a sickness and we need to be careful and, and protect people. But at the same time, amen, it was a government thing. Trying to find out how much they could control people and see where people stood. And they're going to try that again more likely in the future and see if they can't do more, get more control over people's minds. And since then, people haven't come back. Many of them haven't come back to church. Are you listening? They don't have a passion for the things of God. They got a passion for the things outside of God. Now, notice what Jesus speaks about. He said, so sinned I you. His passion to dispel their fear. Two times in these verses he said, peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. Amen. It's either faith and peace or it's fear and turmoil in your heart and your life. It's either faith and peace and getting the gospel out and you're going to do it with the power of God or you're going to have fear and unrest and you're going to sit on the sideline and do nothing. You're going to be a no missionary if you let the devil control your mind And your heart with fear. Amen. We need to be men and women of faith. Let God dispel that fear with his word. Peace be unto you. God's got it under control. Then he he, he talks about the passion to delight their faces. The Bible said in verse 20, when they saw the Lord, then were they glad. Amen. That's what we need to do. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We got too many people looking down in these days in our churches. They're coming in with their head down instead of up. Amen. We don't need to look down in these days. We don't even need to look out other than the eyes of Jesus to reach the law. What we need to do is keep our eyes on Jesus looking up, looking for him to come back at any hour. Knowing he could come back today will keep you motivated to do the right thing today. So keep your eyes up. Amen. People that have their head down usually aren't smiling. They're frowning. They're, they're just there. The people that got their head up, they'll smile. Amen. Keep your head up and smile because God is with you all the way. And you can make a difference in this world with a delighted face. I like to see Christians smile, don't you? I like to see Christians laugh. Hey, man, listen, we can't control the world nor the things of the world, but God can control us. And he wants us to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. And he said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be joyful. And when people of sinner see that, they're going to say, oh, what do you got that I don't have? How can you be happy in your hard time? How can you be happy in the storm? How can you be happy the bottom just fell out in your life? And you still got a smile on your face and a spring in your step and a song in your heart because Jesus is there. And then his passions to direct their future. He said, even so send I you. He wanted to direct their steps. He wanted to direct their future. Hey, are you close enough to God to hear him when he says, I want you to go this way? And then maybe he wants you to turn left. And you hear him say, you turn left. You go this way now. And then you go that. God's navigating. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Amen. Amen. We need to be able to hear the voice of God. When God says, go forward, go forward. When God says, stand still, stand still. When God said, go that way, go that way. But we just need to be uh, sensitive enough and have his word in our heart, be in the prayer closet enough to know God's speaking to me. And when God says, here's the way I want you to go, here's your future, it's out here. Your future's this way with me. It's not that way. The way you've been going, it's not that way. It's not the way, the way you, you were. Here you go. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Isn't that what he said? Passion. Do you have passion to do the will of God? Let me give you the last one and I'm done. My time's gone. I'm gone over a little bit already. Acts 1.8. You know this verse by heart. He said in Acts 1.8, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Both. I want you to notice that word. Then he names four things. Not two. 
Not two, but four. So the both don't mean one, two, like we think of the word both. I'll tell you what it means. But he said, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and in all Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. Now, here's the propagation of missions. He's telling us where to go into all the nations. He said, I want you to go first of all and be a witness in Jerusalem. He names the places. Now, Jerusalem to us, Jerusalem to you, is Greer, South Carolina. That's where he's planted his church. Then he said, Judea, that's your state. That's South Carolina. That's where he's planted this church. Then some, all Samaria, that'd be the rest of the country. And then beyond the borders of our country to uh, the uttermost part of the earth. He names those places in Acts 1.8. Back up a little with the first part, the power needed to propagate the missions. He said, ye shall receive power. It's not a man-made power. It's not something we can work up. It's got to be the power of God. I made mention that. Notice the person. It's the Holy Ghost. Amen. He's called the Holy Ghost in the Bible. He's called the Holy Spirit. What I've learned the difference is the Holy Ghost is his person. He's a person. He lives in you if you're saved. He's God. Amen. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit, when you find that in the Bible, uh, you'll find him doing some kind of work. That deals with his works. And usually when you read the Holy Spirit, something big fixing to happen in the Bible. But when he says the Holy Ghost, he's talking about his person with you. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost. Or we can say it like this. The person of the Holy Ghost is in you. He's in us. Our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Isn't that good? Then notice the plan he gives us. He said, you shall be witnesses unto me both. Now, I made mention that word both don't mean four. It means, it, it don't mean two, rather. It means four. So what is he saying? Uh, I want you to be a witness at home. You're Jerusalem. And the rest of them are beyond. And some of the regions beyond. But I want you to be a missionary. I want you to be a witness at home. And I want you to be a, mission, a missionary, a witness in all the world at the same time. That's what it means. Both at the same time. You got home missionaries. I saw them back there on the wall. I know them personally. You got people that you support right here in South Carolina and in, in our country. Home missionaries, we call them, in our country. And then you've got other missionaries that are going around the world. That's foreign missions, we call it. Amen? Now, some, some churches, all they want to support is home missions. Everybody in their own town, state, some of them in their own city. That's all they'll do. And then some want to support missionaries all over the world but don't want to do anything at home. Well, neither one of them's right. Both of them are good, amen, to be active in. But what they need to do is understand you're supposed to merge those two. You've got to have a balance according to God. He said go and do it both at the same time. So you're to have missionaries here at home. You're to be a missionary here at home. And then you're to send missionaries around the world to the uttermost part of the world. Let me conclude with this, ask you by a question. Are you a go missionary? Are you a go missionary? Are you doing everything you can to get the gospel out yourself personally? Are you a co-missionary? Are you doing everything you can to support the missions of this church faith promise? To pray for those missionaries on your board? Amen. Are you a co-missionary? Laborers together with Christ. Or are you a no missionary? I'm not interested in that. I'm not giving any money for sure. And I'm not going to really concern. I don't even know who my missionaries are back there. I don't have a clue who any of them are. And I really don't care if we had any or not. I'm just concerned about going to church and going home. And coming back to church and going back home. Are you listening? That's a no missionary. We don't want to be that. Which one are you? I want to be a go missionary. And I want to be a co-missionary. But I don't ever want to be a no missionary. Missionary, I want to be on the front lines for the glory of God. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Thank you so much.